uh, Danny Schultz, and on behalf of the Westchester Jewish Council, I'm honored to be introducing today's event, part of uh, the WJC's very successful monthly Israel Connection series. The WJC, as many of you know, is an umbrella organization representing about 135 Jewish groups, schools, and synagogues in Westchester, the eighth largest Jewish community in the United States, totaling about 150,000 citizens. Today's event, sponsored by WJC, uh, is obviously very timely and sensitive. I'm proud to be a board member of WJC and chair of our Israel Affairs Committee, so I'm honored to be hosting our guest today. Our talk will focus on Israel's northern border. We will, of course, touch on the current situation that is real and dynamic, uh, but we will focus on Israel's northern border and we are joined by IDF Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi, the CEO and founder of ALMA, as she will discuss Israel's northern border security challenges with Lebanon, Syria, and Iran. Sarit lives in Kfar Vradim, about nine miles from the border with Syria. Uh, as I mentioned, she is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Reserves um, and CEO and founder of ALMA, which is a nonprofit and independent research and education center specialized in Israel's security challenges on the northern frontier. She has briefed hundreds of groups and forums ranging from US senators, congressmen and women, and politicians, senior journalists, and visiting VIP groups in Israel and overseas. She has written numerous position papers and updates focusing on Lebanon, Syria, and Israel's northern security challenges, and uh, has served for 15 years in the Israeli Defense Forces specializing in military intelligence. Sarit holds a master's in Middle Eastern studies from Ben Gurion University. And she and her husband, Yaron, are raising their five children in Kfar Baradim, the Western Galilee. Uh, please, all of you, kindly use your chat window on Zoom to let us know if you have a question. I will do my best, as usual, to air as many as I can that we haven't covered. We have a lot of ground to cover. And so, Sarit, um, we're going to kick things off. and. Um, in, in a, uh, a more personal way for you to maybe tell us a little bit about uh, your family history in Israel. I suspect it will inform us a bit about your work and what motivates you. <laughs> you know, when I founded Alma, uh, I actually didn't think that uh, my family's history is relevant or uh, is designed um, what I do, but uh, when I think about it, I understand that this is exactly what happened. My father was born in Damascus. Uh, he came here when he was 11 years old and his mother came from Beirut and she always used to, to tell me that Beirut was the pearl of the Middle East or the Paris of the Middle East, which uh, of course it's not the situation today. Um, my mother, uh, was born in Israel. She has a birth certificate written uh, state of Palestine. So she's actually a Palestinian Jew. And uh, her mother was born in Hebron and she was expelled from there when she was only six years old and she was rescued by a Muslim family. And the day after the massacre in 1929, they just expelled outside uh, to the old city of Jerusalem. So I'm making a very long story short uh, but definitely when I look at Lebanon, um, you know, when, no, let's put it this way. When I analyze Lebanon, uh, I always do it from my stomach because I can't, I can't be completely disconnected. When I'm looking about relationships between Arabs and Jews, I, uh, I definitely look at that with the perspective of what happened to my, my grandmother on my mother's side both what happened, the fact that she had to leave Hebron and the fact that she was rescued by a Muslim family. So yes, of course we are designed by our own roots. We can't run away from that. Yeah. So whenever I uh, try to educate my kids about Tubishvat, I always tell them the story about Eli Kohn and the planting of eucalyptus trees in, uh, in Northern Israel. Maps have changed a great deal from the time of pinpointing eucalyptus trees in the Golan Heights. And I've always found that maps tell a story, but need a lot of information and context around them. So what is ALMA and what are you trying to achieve with your work? Just to what you said, terrain is terrain is terrain. Maps are always relevant and heights never change. So it's 67, but it's still relevant for today. 
what is Alma? First, Alma is my daughter. I don't know if you can see the five kids behind me in the picture. She's ours. She's the little one. She's five, seven years old, and she was born when I uh, actually left the army. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of what to do in my civilian life, and I wanted to do something really meaningful that will continue to contribute to my homeland, to, to the state of Israel. And I, I knew that I have kind of a gift. I knew that I could brief groups and convey, you know, very complicated message in a very simple way, in simple words to people who actually don't know what is happening here, because I did that a lot during my service. I met a lot of delegations that came uh, to the Northern Command and wanted to be briefed by intelligence officer. Uh, when I left the army, I find out that I don't have intelligence anymore, and I need to find my own source of, of uh, sources of information, and that's why I established uh, this institute, uh, which is this is my life mission, Alma. And what we are doing here, we we first we analyze, first we gather, we gather the information mainly from Arabic in times of crisis, like in the past 24 hours, so also from Hebrew. And uh, we uh, analyze it and we make it, make, it, make it accessible in a way that people outside of Israel can actually understand. Uh, and of course, in English, everything in, is in English. So the idea is to research and then to educate uh, to educate either by writing and publishing, we have a very active website and blog, but also and mainly by speaking. I, I truly believe there are tons of think tanks, but but uh, people rarely speak. Uh, we, until COVID, met more than 50 groups that came to Israel to the northern border or to Alma Center each month, 50 groups each month. month. Yes, from various audiences from bar mitzvah families to students, educators, and congressmen, senators, uh, political advisors, generals, whatever, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you have a lot of uh, European politicians as well coming through? Um, yes, yes, uh, definitely from around the globe, right. uh, European, Africans, Asian. Right. Uh, we were part of the efforts uh, of the designation of Hezbollah in the UK, in Germany. Uh, we met them before they did that. Uh, we briefed them. We gave them a lot of information concerning the civilian wing of Hezbollah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we were part of that. We were part of the effort to announce the Golan Heights as Israeli by the previous administration. We briefed up, uh, members of the previous administration about the Golan Heights. I definitely didn't recommend anything about that. I didn't imagine that it will end up this way. But I know that uh, my briefing on, on top of the mountain there was part of the process. Uh, this is something I found out later. Um, so we definitely make a difference. And you know what? The best proof for that is the fact that uh, in the past few weeks, we are getting we are intimidated by Hezbollah, Alma Center specifically, and my staff are intimidated by Hezbollah. We are under cyber attacks. And uh, Hezbollah published a video that pinpoint Alma with the coordinates in Google saying we know where you are and uh, we we can we can find you because we did the same to them we exposed uh, 32 missile sites of Hezbollah in Beirut and a few more in South Lebanon and we 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 published that with the exact coordinates so they use the same methodology against us all right so as usual I suspect we're not going to achieve everything we desire in our in our now remaining 51 minutes um <laughs> So a lot is going on in Israel right now. Uh, to, to say, can you give us an update is unfair and, um, and doesn't uh, really ask the right question. But maybe you can dive into the specifics. I think that might be the most helpful. Uh, some of the specific things that we're not really reading about or seeing in the press that you are working on that you can share regarding uh, Israel's security in the North. Um, you know, what story is, has not come out yet uh, about uh, happenings at the northern border, but but please do share what you can uh, about what else is going on on the ground uh, and in the air right now in Israel. So uh, uh, on the ground, I think that what had started is um, clashes, clashes between populations, clashes between radicals from both sides, uh, Jews that attacked Arabs in Jerusalem, Arabs that attacked Jews in Jaffa and Jerusalem, uh, very quickly deteriorated into something completely different. Well, you know, it only takes a small match that somebody will 
uh, throw to the to the to to the region or to Jerusalem, and it explodes. And what is actually happening now is that Hamas and maybe even Iran is taking advantage of these uh, like. Um, local clashes uh, that started in, in specific places in Israel to inflame the situation and to take us to a completely different issue. And it deteriorated, you know, gradually in the past few weeks. So Ramadan month started with massive prayers of Muslims in, in Temple Mount that went very well. There were no problems at all. And uh, tens of thousands of Muslims came uh, every evening or every uh, Friday and, and pray there and, and it worked and as, as it usually does, by the way. Uh, and then it, it started to change by these, as I've said, local clashes between Jews and Arabs uh, here and there. But then what we have seen is that Hamas incited and inflamed the atmosphere, uh, spreading rumors that Israel is preventing Muslims. It's not the first time it is happening again and again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, spreading rumors that Islam is, Israel is preventing Muslims from coming um, and um, gathering a lot of ammunition uh, inside Temple Mount. And my understanding is that the police had uh, intelligence information that this is happening, that a lot of rocks, uh, Molotov battles, etc., are being brought into the compound. And you can see some examples here, how it looks like when they were preparing. Uh, this is from, all of this is from Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when, when they started to use it and to throw it against the gate, I don't know if any of you uh, visit the Temple Mount, there is a separate gate from non-Muslims. Uh, when st they started to attack the gate, the police actually entered the compound and entered the mosques in order to stop it. Now, this is happening since geography, you know, again, uh, terrain is terrain is terrain. Temple Mount is just above the Welling Wall. And what happened yesterday when everything just exploded is that it was the day, the Jerusalem day, the day where in 67, we reunited the city. And there were a lot of Jews that came to the, well, the Welling Wall. And there was a danger that these stones that will be thrown on, on the compound on top will actually hit the prayers below. So the police entered and we can criticize police and say maybe it was too much and maybe it should have been a little bit differently, but of course it doesn't justify what is happening now, which Hamas retaliated with the rockets to Jerusalem. Our classic members had to run full shelter okay. uh, yesterday evening and uh, ten, uh, hundreds of rockets were fired in the past 24 hours to Israel, uh, exemplifying capabilities, uh, rocket capabilities of Hamas that we haven't seen before. I guess IDF knew about it, but we didn't experience this before. More accurate, more, uh, more weight, uh, uh, go to various ranges, salvos with uh, tens of rockets at the same time. And uh, in a sense, it actually challenged uh, Iron Dome. And then you see more hits in homes as happened uh, this afternoon in Ashkelon. And on top of all of that, an IDF retaliation to Gaza, killing uh, um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, commanders and Hamas uh, uh, military infrastructures. Uh, on top of all of that, we have seen riots in the Galilee, which is something I experienced personally because I live in the Galilee and we had excellent relationship with the Arabs surrounding us. And for me, it's just like, I'm still like overwhelmed with, with the fact that uh, uh, we've seen riots. It's not, it's not peaceful demonstration and it's not spontaneous demonstrations. It's riots. It's uh, people that are being stoned by their neighbors that are used to go to shop and to go to the restaurants in these villages. And now uh, the main roads in the north were blocked yesterday night. This is definitely an unusual situation. Um, how all of that is connected uh, to the north and border? Well, you know, it's like a question that is always out there, whether Hezbollah will be involved or not in the past, since, since 2006, it did not, it did not, it, it was not involved, Hezbollah was not involved in any of the escalations between Israel and Palestinians and Gazians. Um, uh, but in 2006, it did. I don't know if you remember, in 2006, everything started in Gaza, not in Lebanon, and we ended up in, in war in Lebanon. So all options are open tonight. Understood. Thank you. Um, so uh, this this 
it may seem like a little bit of a leading question, but you know, would you say that a that an open conflict and war with Hezbollah is inevitable? Um, and if so, what kind of conflict do you think that would be? You know, this is the toughest question to answer um, because as a researcher, of course it's inevitable. Hezbollah is holding about 150,000 rockets targeting Israel. I always say that Hamas are the students and Hezbollah are the professors, uh, though I think that the students are very close to uh, keep up with the professors <laughs> when I see what is happening now. Uh, but uh, 150,000 different kind of artilleries um, located in civilian infrastructure in Lebanon, making the Lebanese human shield. Mm -hmm. uh, tens of these are already PGMs, are already precision guided missiles, uh, which again challenge Iron Dome in a sense that Iron Dome cannot miss. Any miss of a PGM may cause to a catastrophe. Uh, while the ideology, and I'll just give you a small example, uh, the ideology that uh, Iran is indoctrinating to the region uh, very easily, by the way, with the Shiite population in Lebanon and very easily with the Sunni population of Gaza because Hamas itself share from a different point of view, but the same idea against Israel. Uh, an ideology that the state of Israel should not exist. This is just an example, but there are tons of examples uh, to the ideology. This is a, a countdown clock based in Tehran. Uh, was published a few months ago. Uh, I don't know how many of you can read the numbers in Arabic, but uh, or Persian. It's the same letters. Uh, it's about uh, 8,211 days. Uh, for the destruction of the state of Israel, which if you calculate, it's about, uh, about 20 years from today, a little bit more than 20 years from today. That's the ideology we are facing. And as long as we are facing this ideology, nobody can overrule the option of war. Right, right. Uh, out of my ignorance, is there something significant about the day 8,200 and something days from now? Is there uh, not that we have found out, except for the fact that it's it's not the same, but it's pretty close to the dates that we speak about the uh, JCPOA expire and Iran actually becoming a legitimate nuclear power. I had a feeling that there was some overlap. It's there. not. Okay. It's not the same. It's not. It, it, right. that, it's not the same year. This one is a little bit earlier, uh -huh. but uh, it's pretty close. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, let's do a little bit of show and tell, though. You 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 uh, say 150,000 uh, uh, rockets. So those rockets are uh, physical items. They are in locations. Maybe you can pull up for us uh, a map of some of the work you've done. Uh, <laughs> I, I found in going to your website, and I encourage everybody to go to the website. I'll uh, maybe you can just uh, recount the URL for everybody before even doing that. Um, but the the maps uh, are are absolutely fascinating. Yes, yeah, so I will try to uh, to share with you some of the maps of uh, of the human shield. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Um, we have published uh, in two reports thirty two sites of missile sites of Hezbollah in Beirut, and I want to tell you a little bit while I'm finding the report itself, and I will share it with you. In Beirut. Uh, in, in, in Beirut. Beirut. In Beirut. Yes, in Beirut. Uh, want to open the map? Okay, okay, let's do full screen, and then I will share the full screen with you. Right. Now you and can. While see I'm it. distracting you, can you also share with us a little bit about the the whole corridor, then just north of you uh, in the Golan and below into uh, Syria? Um, what the landscape also looks like there? Um, with respect to, you know, indigenous Syrian or Lebanese population, and then the sort of uh, um, encampments of, of non-local players into that whole corridor. That's a separate sure. question, but let's go. Okay, here. so let's let's start just from, from Hezbollah. Yeah. Hezbollah is hiding these 150,000, I'm not even saying rockets, it's, art, it's artilleries. It's including anti-tank and it's including mortars and it's including drones mm -hmm. and everything that can actually uh, by the air target Israel. And what Alma Center did um, is finding or exposing 
uh, information about the locations of these missile sites uh, from uh, social media, which is something that I personally didn't believe that that can happen because I was in, with intelligence and I knew that this information is highly classified and Hezbollah is putting a lot of efforts to not to expose where it, where it is based, but we were lucky enough to locate uh, a database in Wikimapia um, that we, that actually pinpointed with the coordinates of the exact location. And since we knew how to analyze and since we knew how to evaluate the information, and again, I'm not going to repeat all the information in the report, uh, right. we, we could evaluate and we could understand it much better uh, and that way find out that that this is all. This is all true. This is uh, this is what it is. Like you could see in the map, uh, a lot of locations in in the very crowded area of Beirut. Uh, these were um, <clears throat> kind of polygons that um, actually pointed at uh, launching sites and uh, warehouses. Later on, we had found from different from another source uh, again warehouses in South Lebanon and uh, not far from Nabatia, which we exposed. Uh, and we actually made public something that was very secret uh, by Hezbollah, the fact that it is using the Lebanese as human shield and the fact that it is just an example because there are thousands of places like this in Lebanon, thousands of, of homes and uh, civilian buildings that are being used for military purposes uh, by Hezbollah. This is the way that this is working. Now you were asking, about uh, the ground corridor, or maybe it's not just a ground corridor, it just, you know, a corridor it could be maritime corridor, it could be air corridor, and it could be a ground corridor that goes right. all the way from Tehran to Damascus and, and Beirut, both, by the way. There are direct flights. Imagine that you are an American, you can fly from Tehran to Beirut in a civilian airplane, but you will have rockets below your seat and you would not know that. So it's just an example. Ground corridor is um, about 1,000 miles that uh, goes all the way from Tehran to Damascus. And uh, there are like three main routes that, uh, that uh, we identified, but the middle one is the most active one with the border crossing named El Bukamal between Iraq and Syria, where the Iranians established a base there their uh, base, their um, proxies, their militias, which are not even neither, not necessarily Syrian and not necessarily Iraqis. Uh, over there, they are making uh, projects of Shiization, of making the population Shiite in these areas, because always the civilian project goes hand in hand with the military one. Uh, and that way they control the border crossing, which enabled them to transfer all this ammunition and, and soldiers all the way from Iran <coughs> through Iraq, then to Syria uh, and Damascus, and then if necessary uh, to Beirut. You spoke about various players. So I want to make things a little bit complicated for you <laughs> uh, because it was very simple and put in now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I hope you can see this um, graph that we've made because you know, uh, I, I spoke with the head of my research department, Tal Beeri, who writes uh, most of the reports of Alma, and I told him, okay, I'm confused. It's too many players. We published too many reports. You need, you need to explain this to me. And, and I, I just took a pencil and I, uh, I started to, you know, to, to pen this. And then I made a PowerPoint out of this because even for me, it was too complicated to understand what the hell is going on over there in Southern Syria. This is, this is only Southern Syria. This is not all Syria all of Syria. And in Southern Syria, what you can actually see is that since the rebels lost in 2018, the area of the border with Israel, uh, it's not just the Syrian government they took over. It's the Syrian government and few more new neighbors that we have now, uh, which a little bit of ISIS terror cells, a little bit of independent local militias that are still here and there fighting against the government, but and, and a little bit of Russian presence there, including uh, controlling one of the uh, Syrian army corps, the fifth corps. But mainly what you see is IRGC, is Iranian Revolutionary Guard over there, uh, Quds Force, 
which is building its power with various players, meaning using Hezbollah with two units, as you see in yellow, uh, using uh, building militias, the same militias of rebels that used to fight against, uh, against the government, against the you know, uh, Shiite axis, what we call the Shiite axis led by Iran, these same militias are now joining this axis against Israel, against, uh, you know, uh, again, local militias that are still opponents to the government, etc. And we made a report and we found 36 local militias that are now loyal to the Iranians, that are now loyal to the, uh, to, to the Shiite axis, as we call it. Uh, and on, on top of that, you have also the what we call the traditional militias that the Iranian brought into Syria. Fatim Yuna is an example, which are not, they're, they're just Afghans. They're not even from the region. And they were brought over there. So we have a lot of new guests, as you can understand, and on our border. And, and they're not always friendly. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I know you mentioned earlier that you were, were part of a, a, a briefing, I think you, you implied, and that some of your briefing about the Golan, you know, was used in, I guess, some of the decision making around that maybe by the U.S. government. But, um, you know, what does it mean in, in, in your eyes to sort of control uh, the Golan Heights? Um, uh, you know, what does that mean? mean today it's very i mean I, it was interesting you said at the beginning that if i got it right that things certain things don't change you know elevations and heights don't change um but what does it mean today uh, with missiles and um uh and other means of combat to control that area uh, it means that we push iran away uh, from the sea of Gali. As simple as that. Uh, and it means that we push Iran away from intimidating the communities which are based in a, based in a Hula Valley. Uh, we need a map, right? <laughs> okay, so let's take a like look said, at the map. Maps are, maps are everything, right? Maps are everything. So this is a map. I will move. This is a map of the border. You can see uh, the Sea of Gali uh, behind me. Yes, quite helpful. Um, you can see pretty much where I'm based uh, yep. behind me. And uh, now that you can understand where Syria is, you can understand that the area that you're looking at in Syria is the area that I've just described uh, being uh, controlled uh, by Iran and its proxies over there. And if uh, we will give up the Golan, which is the area uh, left to the border and above the Sea of Gali and up north to it, uh, the heights, everything that is brown in the map is much higher than the green areas in the map. Mm -hmm. uh, the heights would mean that uh, we, are, we are back in 67. We are back to a situation that uh, artillery will go very easily down to the valley. It will, what we see now in Gaza will be kindergarten uh, comparing to what will happen here. This is without talking of, you know, um, frightening scenarios about the Sea of Gali, the fact that we, they will have access to sources of water, um, they can cross the country. Uh, when, when you stand in the Hermon Ridge, which was also taken in 67, you, as one of our soldiers said, you, this is the eyes of Israel. You can see all the way down. And from many places in Israel, you can actually see uh, Hermon Ridge. And that way you can understand again, uh, geography. So, you know, um, Israelis are very um, diverse and, and disagree on, on many topics uh, concerning security. But I think that when we speak about Golan Heights today, there is pretty much a consensus that uh, we cannot give it up because on the other side of the border, there is no one to talk to that can actually make peace with us about that. Right, it's not right. right. Group peace. Right. No, very interesting point. So. Um, what have you found to be, I suppose, one of the more surprising elements uh, of some of your research and insight that people are really not aware of when you speak to people uh, in positions of influence and power regarding the border? What, do you, where, where, what few elements of your research and maps and data are the kind of items where you, you catch people sitting back in their chair saying, okay, that, that I was not aware of? 
Uh, almost everything. Almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm speaking about all the audiences I've met, beginning from students and up to political advisors, almost everything. And I'll tell you why, because most of the information that is provided uh, about the security of Israel or the stability of the Middle East is about Palestinian issue. Mm. And, uh, and, and I, I truly believe that Palestinian issue, and definitely since what is going on in the past 24 hours, Palestinian issue is highly important, but it's not the issue. The issue is radicals, radical Islam, whether it's ISIS, whether it's Hamas, Sunnis, or whether it's Iran and its proxies in Syria and Hezbollah, Shiites. Uh, today, uh, I think Iran is stronger and it is using Hamas, which is Sunni, uh, to fight Israel. And Hamas became in the past few years, and it was not like that at the beginning, Hamas also became a proxy of Iran in the past few years. So when we speak about information, they hardly know anything. And that's very sad. They hardly, they hardly know history, how these uh, states were created. What is 67, what is 73? Um, what we experience when this is war, the fact that war is inside Israel, the fact that war is not, you know, miles away, this is an experience that we have again and again and again with students. We have a simulation in Alma Center that we bring the, the groups to become Israelis. And, and, you know, there are two dilemmas. And the first dilemma is whether to take the risk of war. And Americans usually take the risk of war, but Israelis usually don't. Israelis uh, don't want to deteriorate into war because you see what is happening when there is war, you know, there are rockets everywhere in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Um, the American main theme that, that, that people don't, you know, feel uncomfortable with is the fact that there is no solution. They always ask me, what's the solution? Hmm. There is no solution, when, especially when we speak about the North, you know, we can have a debate whether there is a solution with the Palestinian issue, but when we speak about the North, there is no solution. Okay. Um, what do you mean by that? I mean, I think I know what you mean, but I also know enough to know that the I think part is where I need to ask you a question. What, what do you mean there is no solution? Um, it means, and for example, if you look about the on the withdrawal from Lebanon in 20,000, in the year 20,000, why had we uh, withdrawn without an agreement? because there is no one to sign an agreement with, because Hezbollah do not uh, recognize the existence of the state of Israel. Likewise, Iran, which is now controlling Syria, and likewise ISIS, which, had, which was controlling uh, the southern part of the Golan in the, in the area just behind me over here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there is no solution when, you know, the other side do not recognize your existence. And, and saying very clearly that you should learn how to swim, I'm quoting, uh, go back to European, your European homes, and mm -hmm. you already know that it's not my home at least, um, and not the home of half of the Israelis, uh, and, you know, uh, threatening to completely uh, wipe Israel out of the map. So yeah. we don't have solutions. We only have answers in the way how to keep it calm, because that's the main interest of the state of Israel, to keep it calm. Right. Right. Okay. So one of the things I'm hearing you say, and it's a theme that I've uh, now picking up on uh, from other of our uh, monthly series and conversation with Hussein Abu Bakr uh, a month ago and, and others, um, that as much as we try to focus on countries, you know, in the West, we're very trained uh, to think about countries and their domain. But your language, um, and even one of the questions you and I went over, how do you distinguish between the forces at bear in Lebanon, Syria, and Iran, and tell us where they overlap or are homogeneous? I now even realize in my question that I didn't refer to Lebanon and Syria as countries. I actually said, how do you distinguish between the forces at bear in those places? And I, and I think I noticed in what you've said and what other people say that we're not dealing with, with any countries or governments here. And I suspect that makes it a much more pernicious, uh, uh, challenging problem. Maybe you can address that and we'll obviously get to the JCPOA conversation, but, but talk about that for a second. Lebanon, Syria, homogeneity, heterogeneity of governments. Um, that's easy. Look at the map behind me. 
Yeah. And you can see there are like spots in various colors in the map. Mm -hmm. So in the Lebanese side, which is here, you can see yellow spots, which are Shiites, Shiite towns. Mm -hmm. um, Hezbollah uh, is Shiite, Iran is Shiite, and South Lebanon, Lebanon is Shiite. Uh, on the other side, you can see uh, Syria, which is in green. Most of the towns in southern Syria are Sunnis, Sunni are in green. Uh, homogeneous, this is how it is being said. Uh, look at the Israeli side of the map, yeah. and you can see that it's definitely heterogenic. The Galilee is 50% non-Jewish population, 50, 60, I don't know, around that. Mm -hmm. uh, Christians, Druze, Muslims, whatever. Uh, and also Jews, okay? And we usually yeah. live together until yesterday night. Yeah, uh, the, blue, the blue in the map uh, is used. Okay, fine. Yeah, the blue is used, the pink is Druze. Um, yeah, with stripes, it's like, uh, um cities where you have uh, various types of populations etc what what is lebanon and syria lebanon and syria are two countries where uh, they are collapsing countries uh, syria is a country that experienced dictatorship that in the past decade is going through a civil war half of the population in, of syria lost their homes half of the half about six million people left syria completely it is diverse population in a sense that northern Syria is uh, ethnically Kurdish, all the rest is mostly Arabs. When we speak about religion, the majority, more than 60%, were Sunnis before the civil war. I, am, I have no clue how many Sunnis are in Syria today. Nobody knows. Some were Shiites, some were Alawites, which is kind of a branch of the Shiites. Some were Druze, a lot of Balagan, chaos. Okay, Assad with its dictatorship somehow uh, and previous dictators in Syria managed to, to hold it uh, for a few decades since it was founded. It was founded like Israel in the 40s by the French mandate. French and the British 100 years ago painted maps to their own interest and a little bit to the interest of the people in the region. Uh, you know, kind of a compromise between the interest of France and, uh, France and Great Britain and the interest of the people in the region, of the locals. In Lebanon, even more complicated, it is not a dictatorship, it's supposed to be a democracy, but today it is dominated by Hezbollah, a very diverse society, 13 religious sects. Uh, today it's mostly Shiites, but when it was uh, founded again in the 40s, it was mostly Christians, but they wanted uh, the greater Lebanon, this is the phrase they use. And when they got the greater Lebanon, they got Shiite population. And they have also Sunni population and Druze population. And what unites them? What makes them stick together? So we, we wanted to believe, and I'm saying that Israelis and Americans alike, wanted to believe that Lebanese can be united because there is no dictatorship in Lebanon, that they can actually develop Lebanese identity, but all of that was challenged eventually by Hezbollah. And here I'm getting to what you said about states or non-states players. You're right that most of the players that we are dealing with are actually non-states players, which is Hezbollah in Lebanon. And again, it's all these militias in Syria <clears throat> and Hamas in Gaza and even Palestinian Authority, which was supposed to become a state, but it didn't happen. But actually in the Northern border, it's pretty simple because today, and it was not the situation two years ago, but today these are non-state players that are getting very deep support of a state, which is Iran. And I'm not, not talking about the Iranian people, which is a different story. I'm talking about the Iranian government. And as long as the Iranian government is the government of the Ayatollahs, they are, cultivating and nourishing non-state players everywhere in the Middle East, including on our borders. Right, right. Complicated, I know. <laughs> which, which takes us <clears throat> further east and to the subject of the JCPOA, which I always think is a Jewish organization when I hear the letters initially, but I know it's, of course, that's not what the J stands for. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, Iran and the JCPOA and, and um, 
you know, Israel's northern border. Uh, a lot, I'm sure a lot of what you are, and, and, and we're going to bring in the Abraham Accords into this as well as we continue sort of along this path of conversation, but um, I'll, I'll leave it as an open-ended question and let you riff, as we say, on the subject of Iran and the JCPOA. And, um, you know, clearly if they're pulling the strings, as we know, I mean, I think most of the people on this call are, are fairly knowledgeable and, and wise, but give us some of your deeper insight into that relationship and what it means uh, for Israel. The JCPOA, the cancellation of the JCPOA, or the getting back to the JCPOA? Well, okay, there you go. I said I left it as an open-ended question, so you can make it a three-part question. But let, let's let's uh, let's focus maybe on uh, the cancellation, which triggered certain actions, right? I suspect is an important area to touch on, and then on top of that, um, re-entering into that conversation with uh, with Iran about reinstituting that agreement so first i want to make like a disclaimer statement <laughs> Go right i have no uh, issue with america american politics okay i can't vote in the united states i only vote for my own government and it's complicated enough <laughs> okay. now having said that uh, of course as an israeli when we are looking at of what is happening with these negotiations and i truly want to start from 2015 uh, and okay. we, we see um, some problematic assumptions, let's put it this way. Uh, and the main problematic assumption is that you can gain uh, what you want in a negotiation uh, when with Iran, in a negotiation with Iran, when you declare that you are going to solve the problem by negotiation. Now, everybody here, uh, all Israelis are not interested in war with Iran. I'm saying that, and I truly believe that none of us is interested in war because as I've said, war means a Israeli home front getting a lot of fire, mm -hmm. okay? War with Iran means Hezbollah launching its 150,000 rockets to Israel. This is very clear to all of us. But if you want to get what you want, meaning to make sure that Iran would not become nuclear power in the region, you must keep the military option on, on the table. You must. Because Iran is not um, a faithful uh, counterpart. Rouhani, which is the artist of negotiation since it started uh, two decades ago, his mission was to make sure that the negotiations would continue because as long as the negotiation were continued, Iran could do whatever it wanted. Now, I truly don't know, since you mentioned that, I truly don't know whether Iran violated the agreement or it didn't violate the agreement. What I know is that the Iranians made huge lemonade out of the lemon, which is the JCPOA. Because, okay, let's assume that they didn't violate the agreement but the agreement gave the Iranians the opportunity to invest in other channels because the sanctions were off. And that way uh, they could um, invest in the missile program, they could strengthen their own regime inside Iran, and they could invest in the Middle East. All Everything I've just described for you in Syria started in 2015 in the way it is that you've seen it now. Until 2015, it was mainly what they called councils, uh, advisors that came to Syria. It was not militias as you see today. All of that started after 2015. Now, if you take into consideration also the fact that the JCPOA is limited in time, so the Iranians said, okay, we'll wait, no problem. We'll do everything else and then we'll come back to the nuclear problem. This is assuming that they didn't violate the agreement. Now, none of us know, and I'm not sure intelligence agencies know whether they violated the agreement because the agreement do not enable inspection by surprise, especially not to military bases. And that's why when we are talking back, we're, we, when we are talking about the option of going back to the agreement and canceling all the sanctions, Israel is very 
uh, upset. Israel is very worried because we are worried about the timeline. We are worried about money coming into Iran, which means money coming into Hezbollah, money coming into the militias in Syria, and money coming in to rebuild uh, the um, internal uh, position of the Ayatollahs in Iran. Uh, as for the sanctions, when the JCPOA was signed, the Supreme Leader of Iran said, we will keep the agreement, I'm talking 2015, we will keep the agreement only if all the sanctions will be canceled. Right. And Iran is holding the same position until today. Don't ignore this statement. He totally meant that. Now, what do you do? And it's an open question of what you do. <laughs> Yep, understood, understood. So, so let's add another then piece to this uh, this chessboard here for the moment. Let's talk about the Abraham Accords and how uh, how you know those developments and some of those other pressures from countries in the region um, help Israel with respect to Iran, or maybe don't, maybe change some urgency on the part of Iran. Um, you know, what I call the law of unintended consequences. It's all great to make uh, normalization and, you know, peace with lots of neighbors, but it may also, to your point about Iran, drive them to do certain things that we may not have expected. I don't know. So uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, um, I, I, needed, I needed to sharpen the question. A little okay. Bit. Have you seen, let me put it this way. As soon as the Abraham Accords in individually, each piece of them were signed, did you notice any specific changes? Uh, not that you could directly correlate to that, but um, did you notice any changes uh, fairly quickly in things that you see on the ground uh, along the border? Perhaps not. Uh, I'm just saying no, that. along the border, no. I okay. think that's that's uh, no, that's that's not the case. <clears throat> uh, we share something. Israel and, and uh, these countries, uh, mainly the UAE and Bahrain, share something. We share uh, the same um, enemy, the same threat, which is Iran. And the UAE is very close to Iran. So I I think that uh, what Israel was actually saying is Iran, you have a front with Israel in Lebanon and the Golan Heights, we now have a front with you uh, from the UAE. We are, we are getting closer to Iran. You know, terrain is terrain is terrain. We are getting closer to Iran by having these uh, Abraham Accords with the UAE. And the same for the UAE and Bahrain. They are feeling very much intimidated by the Iranians. And now they get the support of United States and they get the support, or not the support, the collaboration of Israel. In a sense that you will enable it to face and to deal with threats by Iran. This is one thing. Another thing is that I think, <clears throat> and this is exactly what Hamas and Iran is trying to challenge in the past 24 hours, but I think that something happened here in the past decade, and we see this everywhere, it's, it's with, the, the, the failure of, of the revolution in Syria. It's with the, the Arabs inside Israel. It's the fact that Israel became a, an economic power. I don't want to say superpower, but definitely a power with the issue of uh, innovation uh, and, and technology. Right. And I think that many in the Middle East understood that maybe the Palestinians are not the issue and maybe we can change the, the timeline. We can start from creating relationship and economic and maybe security relation, business relationship with Israel. And then this will help us to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not instead of solving it, it will be the tool to get to a progress in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If there, there is much more, um, a better economic situation for everybody, including the Palestinians themselves. Yeah, no, this can change, this can change the equation. Yes. It can bring totally different, new thinking of what is happening here. 
Yeah. And I think this is what the Abraham Accords mainly brought. They brought, for me as an Israeli, they brought hope that we can do things in a different way. And it is being challenged in the past 24 hours, no doubt. And, and we'll have to see where this is heading. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you think any of the violence is um, sort of uh, in a way acting out against the Abraham Accords or it's really more... Um, localized uh, and uh, a specific response really to things that have happened in, in Jerusalem and in Gaza, et cetera? No, it is definitely kind of a dialogue mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Hamas is trying to create to say, look what Israel is doing in Jerusalem, don't you care? Saudi Arabia, don't you care? Jordan, don't you care? UAE, don't you care? All these countries that signed peace agreements with Israel, don't you care? Of course you care. Right. So if you care, do something. And I think this is exactly what Hamas is trying to do. And um, we always said that there is no coincidence in the Middle East. The mm -hmm. timing, timing is everything. And the timing here is identifying the political crisis in Israel, uh, testing the new administration in the United States, and the postponing of the elections in the Palestinian Authority. And I, see, I think all these three uh, issues which are completely not connected to each other made uh, Hamas make this decision to try to escalate the situation and to see how this can undermine the, the strong position Israel gained in the past decade. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have anybody on what I'd call the other side uh, who, who feel uh, as sort of like-minded or have complementary views that, that can help uh, influence? Do you have, uh, you know, without, without giving anything away, but I mean, are there, are there other organizations and individuals that um, you communicate with uh, on some of these issues on, again, what I'll just call, quote, the other side, whether that's uh, uh, philosophically or geographically other side? It's not a direct dialogue since we cannot uh, talk with enemy countries. Uh, but what we have seen happening, this is very interesting. When I founded Alma, uh, I thought that my main goal is to speak in English and to speak to people like you in the United uh -huh. States and elsewhere. Because as I've said, there is lack of knowledge over there. Uh, but then I find out that you know yeah. Twitter can translate everything. And uh, when we publish something in English, many people just press it translation button and it is translated to Arabic and today we have a lot of followers that are coming from the Arab world and some of them support us and, and support what we do and some of them curse us and uh, wish us uh, all the best in uh, hell and uh, <laughs> but uh, we definitely created kind of a dialogue with Hezbollah that as I've said intimidated us but also with those who are the opponents to Hezbollah. Now, those who are opponents to Hezbollah do not say clearly that they are using any information that is coming from Israel, but we see this happening. And the best example is what happened a few months ago in one of the municipalities of Beirut, uh, which is a Christian municipality. And the members of the municipality resigned because they saw our report and they saw that we pointed at missile site in their municipality. And they demanded from the Lebanese army to check whether there are rockets there, which of course they didn't do anything or didn't find anything. Right. And, and they said these uh, municipality members resigned saying, we don't want to be responsible for another blast. If there are rockets here, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, you know, um, what, what, what we learned during the time that we, we can, well, that our information gets also to those who are, who don't like what is happening with Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the main opponents to Hezbollah are either dead or outside of Lebanon. The main opponents to Iran are either dead or outside of Iran. Um, you cannot find you know, a meaningful opposition mm -hmm. that can actually overthrow uh, the control of, of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of uh, entities on the other side that are looking to sort of pinpoint, I mean, I imagine Israeli uh, 
uh, military sites and installations uh, on our side of the border. Uh, similarly, I mean, I imagine those are just government uh, military entities that do that, but they must be looking to do the same thing on our side of the border as, as we try to do on their side of the border. What do you mean by cyber? Uh, yeah, cyber or um, just in terms of sort of publishing. I, I, I guess if you look at Arabic uh, um, news information, are there uh, similar uh, reports about um, Israeli military fortification ah. in the Golan? Okay, now I understand what you're asking. Um, so after we published uh, these sites in Beirut, for example, Hezbollah published, we, we, what we wanted to say is that Hezbollah is using the Lebanese human shield. So what Hezbollah had done is publishing a propaganda video, um, <clears throat> painting the sites of IDF, as you said, in Tel Aviv, the headquarters in Tel Aviv, and uh, the, the command bases in Southern Command, Northern Command, et cetera which are based, Southern Command is in Beersheba, Northern Command is in Sfat, so they are based in the cities. And said, you see, IDF is using human shield as well, it is doing the same thing, and we know where they are and we can target them. But of course it's different because IDF is not based in homes, it is bases and you can see them very clearly. But Hezbollah is doing that all the time. Uh, propaganda of Hezbollah is uh, saying, we know where you are and we're gonna get you, this is happening all the time. Right, right, so I wanna encourage people to ask more questions. We've had a couple. Um, one is uh, on the settlements. Do you think that the spread of settlements plays a, a significant role in exacerbating uh, the larger situation? Now, again, I know we're talking about the northern border here. That's a question really a little less uh, specific to the northern border, but uh, I don't know if you feel that's one that is in your domain, but I didn't want to leave it out, certainly. Um, the Saudis, you're asking about the, the Saudis? Do you think the spread of settlements play a significant role in exacerbating the larger situation. So not with respect to Saudis, just the settlements. As uh, a settlement, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, um, you know, again, it's all about the timing. Uh, I was, um, we were, Alma staff were invited uh, to a tour uh, in Samaria, hmm. uh, just a, a day before the escalation. Hmm. Uh, and we went there, we went to see. And what we learned, and you know, we are experts, and I have uh, MA in Middle Eastern Studies, blah, 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 and I'm an Israeli. Uh, moreover, my parents used to live in Samaria, and I've learned that I don't know anything, that uh, there is a lot to learn, and there is a lot to, to learn about relationships in Samaria between Jews and Arabs. There is a lot to learn about um, what is truly Judah and Samaria when we speak about Jewish history and legacy. Uh, and there is a lot to learn about the terrain is terrain is terrain. What you can see when you stand in the settlement in Samaria, looking at Tel Aviv. Um, and we were we also criticized their point of view. It's not that we agreed with everything they said, but it's definitely a story which is not being told. And I, I cannot be the presenter of this story because I don't live there. But I definitely feel that um, that the settlements, the way they are being drawn in the media in Israel and outside of Israel, uh, it, it, it's not exactly the way it is. There is much more to it. It's half a million people that are living there for two generations at least. Many of them, like myself, come from families that were expelled from Judah and Samaria in 48 or 29 and came back. I Gush Etzion, it's a good example. Yeah. Uh, Jews used to live in Hebron for hundreds of years. And there are homes of Jews in Hebron for hundreds of years that are now taken by Muslims. Uh, and these are just, again, very few examples for anecdotes for what is uh, Judah and Samaria. Bottom line is that I don't think, if, if you want to create two state solution, where well, you have a Jewish state with there are no Arabs and an Arab state, an Arab state where there are no Jews. So it's a problem that you have the settlements. But if you understand that there will be Jews in the Arab state and there will be Arabs in the Jewish state, you can adopt a totally different point of view. Right, right. So um, I'm gonna ask another question that we've had in, in my own way um, uh, and that'll maybe take us to, to 
close things out a little bit, which is, uh, and I have so much more to ask. Uh, actually, before I even ask that one last question, are you, you talked about the translation button. I meant to touch on this. Are, are you though actively now publishing in Arabic or you're sort of letting people go ahead? I mean, they're gonna use the translation button anyway on whatever you publish in English. But are you looking to specifically publish in Arabic or have you been doing that? We've done that very, very little. If I had the resources, though there is the translation button, I would have been, I, I would have published not only in English. 98% is being published in English. Uh, and 2% is Arabic. Gotcha. But uh, I would have done that with seven languages, you know, Arabic, Persian. Our reports were quoted in Iran as well. Um, uh, Russian, France, Spanish. Uh, I would love that my materials would would get to these audiences in a much right. more uh, accessible way. And I asked that question because it is my my lead up to my final question, which is: uh, so, what constituencies uh, or groups do you want to get in front of uh, and share your work with that you feel haven't really yet had sufficient? You haven't had sufficient access to. I know you've talked about, you know, languages obviously mean a lot, but it could be organizations in the United States. It could be uh, in Europe. Obviously, language, when you say Russian, uh, it's not lost on any of us that you want what you've been doing to be read by the powers that be there. But what, what constituencies or groups and what tools, when you talk about translation, do you, you feel are important for you to really um, accelerate and... Uh, um, uh, and get, gain some more leverage on distribution of what you're doing. Look, I, I, uh, I was an intelligence officer, but before that I was in the university. And I went, during my uh, MA, I was recruited back to the army, to intelligence. So um, the audience I personally want to get to is the audience of students. Uh, they, they are the future the generation that will lead United States, Europe, Russia, whatever. And as far as I understand, you know, if I'm trying to analyze uh, students, uh, Middle East students are either, I'm sorry, I forgot to make this. Uh, students uh, Middle, from in Middle East departments are, are either, Middle East departments are either financed by Jewish organizations or by Saudi Arabia. Right. If they are financed by Saudi Arabia, I'm not sure anybody would listen, uh, but I wish I could get to these audiences and, and create a dialogue, even, even though we probably disagree. Uh, students for political science uh, don't know enough, actually don't know enough about the Middle East, and many of them are becoming the future leadership. So I would love to get to those to mm -hmm. students of political science, to the educators, to the professors, and just for one day, to make them experience what it is to be an Israeli, like today, for example. Yeah. Uh, this is if I, you know, that's why uh, uh, my big dream, if I could get to them. Well, listen, your, your work is so very important. It is uh, uh, one o'clock and there are so many more maps and data and information that I would want to um, dive into with you. So perhaps we can have an encore at some point um, and perhaps some of the other listeners here, as I said, we're an umbrella organization, so perhaps some of the other listeners will pull you into other venues uh, and other organizations to give you that distribution and exposure and perhaps even translation. But um, we wish you all the best. I know you mentioned to us on the pre-call, just so everybody knows, that you're worried about your son and his friends who are on their way home and not traipsing around parts of uh, Israel right now where they may not be so safe. So we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.